In this video, I'm going to interview former Secret Service agent Kevin Rice, who worked presidential, vice presidential, and candidate details during his 23 years in the Secret Service to get his insight an opinion and reflection about the unfortunate incident that occurred on July 13th when someone tried to take former President Trump's life, but unfortunately also injured two others, I believe, and then killed a retired fire chief. Horrific incident. Let's get into my interview with Kevin Rice. Let's let's dive into the unfortunate occurrence that's happened this past weekend. I hate we have to talk about it. I, I'm yeah. still shocked. I mean, it, it shocked the whole country, in my opinion. Based on your experience and your knowledge of Secret Service operations, and I understand you can't give everything away. What determining factors are typically assessed to determine how many Secret Service agents are needed for a certain event? Sure. So this, th there's not a really short answer to this. And if you're, get it. Yeah. if you'll allow me, um, it's very sad and I'm very uh, frustrated and I'm disappointed, right? Um, but I am not going to pile on and I'm not going to be a, a Monday morning quarterback. I was not there. I can tell you about what our standards, what Secret Service standards are what our normal um, kind of protocols are. I'm not going to pile on. There will be an investigation. They will find out exactly what went wrong. Um, the Secret Service is staffed with, you know, 3,000 agents who are human beings, uh, 12, 1,200 uniformed division officers who are human beings. Um, and we, we have a zero fail mission. Uh, and our goal is every day to, is to meet that mission. But so having said that, um, so former President Trump, you know, through his staff, makes a call to Secret Service operations and they say, hey, we're going to this site um, on this day. An advanced team is created. So in this case, um, it's just outside of Pittsburgh. So the Donald Trump's protective detail calls the Pittsburgh field office and says on such and such a date, we're going to have a, a venue. He has political staff and then we have Secret Service and both have uh, advanced teams. And in this case, the advanced team uh, is generally staffed with input from the Trump detail by the closest field office, whatever field office has the jurisdiction, right? So there are, and I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but there would normally be agents from the Pittsburgh field office who would be assigned uh, to that visit. And what happens is, the way the Secret Service works is we rely on what we call a counterpart system and, we, uh, and an advanced team system. So an advanced team is basically, uh, let me start at the top. You have an advanced team that consists of a lead advance. So that's the agent generally with a lot of tenure who's been around the block, who's seen everything, who's normally post detail. So he's been on a, a detail uh, as a permanent assignment. And he or she is responsible for basically supervising this team. So for lack of a better term, they're a sergeant or a lieutenant that's in charge of this entire visit, right? So from the time that plane touches down in Pittsburgh's jurisdiction till the time it leaves, this lead advance agent is responsible for overseeing everything. Um, and then we break it down into smaller missions, right? Because uh, the movement of, a, of a, a presidential candidate with a high threat level or the president or vice president or a foreign head of state, it is an orchestra, right? So you you can't, one person can't do it all. So it's got to be, you've got all these different players. So there is a person who's uh, called a site advance agent whose only responsibility is the airport. And then you've got another agent whose job it is to be the transportation agent. Their only job is to run the routes, primary, alternate, secondary routes for the airport to the site, the site to the airport, the site to the hospital, the site to a relocation center, the right. So, uh, and, and let me backtrack. Every person that is on that team, part of that advanced team, has what we call a counterpart. So we ask for, the Secret Service asks for, assistance from state and local agencies. We are too small an agency to do this on our own. Um, and so we're also in that, you know, in this case, we're in Butler, um, but we're in the state of Pennsylvania. We want complete uh, and utter cooperation from the local and state authorities who were operating in their districts. Right. We and we maintain these friendships and we remain uh, maintain these relationships. We want buy in from them. We need their involvement. We need their help. Right. So that airport agent 
has a police officer that's assigned to him. That uh, transportation agent is being guided probably by the Pennsylvania State Police. Um, so in addition to the site agent at the site, you've got other um, entities. In this case, on Saturday, there was a counter sniper uh, team available. That counter sniper team does their own advance. They go to the site, they go to the airport, they go along the motorcade route and they look for their concerns. And we can address that in a second. Um, we also, in most venues, have what we call counter surveillance agents. So those are plainclothes agents who are on the perimeter. They're on the outside looking in, right? Um, you have a magnetometer advance. You have um, uniform division officers who are responsible for making sure that no one gets into that post that hasn't been what we call clean, right? Hasn't we make sure there's no weapons being brought into the to the venue. So it is an orchestra in every aspect. It's a play. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, and it often takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of cohesion. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to introduce that advanced team concept and the counterpart system um, so that your listeners have a kind of a better understanding of how that works. There's a lot that goes into it. One thing that did come to mind, particularly as of right now, while I'm interviewing you, it was discovered that local law enforcement had more of the control or, or was put in control of securing the area where the uh, would-be assassin was located. So my thing is, my, or my curious question is, is it is it difficult for local law enforcement to communicate with the Secret Service, say, had they had the chance to, to say, get off the stage or anything like that? It's, right. I, I, I'm like you. I don't want to just, I don't want to bash. I want to ask questions and then, yeah, we'll just talk, uh, give, give information as, as best you can, uh, all pointing towards how we can look at things in a good way and, and, uh, think about, and, and, and I know the secret service is going to think about solutions going forward. So, right. but I think it's okay to ask questions. So I was just Absolutely. curious about the communication thing and challenges that, that can come about. So I don't know the specifics on Saturday's event, but I can tell you what normal protocol is, is mm. somewhere at that site or just a little off site, something the Secret Service calls the command post. And it's a little different than like what we consider like incident command posts in, you know, in, in regular law enforcement. The command post is the way the Secret Service uses it is basically it's a it's a communications hub. And generally uh, it is set up with the, you know, when it's a president or vice president of the White House Communications Agency sets it up, when it's a, any other protectee, the Secret Service is really responsible for the communications. But we have a, a normally at least one, if not more, senior people in the Secret Service. So people with tenure who are operating our radios. But along with that, we generally put uh, someone of rank from the police and fire rescue and also someone of rank from the one or more of the police agencies that are assisting us. So, you know, we talked about, you know, some of the things we have on the, on the perimeter. One of the things, if we have a counter sniper team assisting us is we have counter sniper response teams and that's an agent and it's a police officer from the, you know, the state or local. And if somebody sees something or if, if CS, if the counter sniper team sees something and they, they're not going to take action immediately. They generally get on the radio and they say, I've got whatever a suspicious person at the Northwest corner of, you know, and we operate off a clock system, right? So um, at three o'clock, there's a, you know, person, gray hat, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if it's not an immediate threat, then that CS team, that's uh, the counter sniper response team responds to it and tries to figure out what that problem is. So, um, as far as communications, the Secret Service doesn't operate off the same frequencies as the police department or the fire, right? So we couldn't, there's no way we could conceivably do that with all the different departments in America. So in order to solve that, what we do is make sure there are representatives in our command post, you know, kind of our radio room. So if a police officer, and I don't know what happened on Saturday, but if a police officer saw something, he or she couldn't call it into that command post. Now we've got everybody on the same sheet of music. We've got the police department, we've got the Secret Service, we've got Fire Rescue. We're all able to talk to each other. It's kind of in a disjointed way, 
but it's not immediate, but it's within a few seconds that a police officer, if they've gotten information to pass, it can get to the people that need to get to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're right. We, we weren't, you and I weren't there uh, and an investigation will be done, but I'm, I'm sure I'm like you. I'm very curious because now we're learning that there was possibly a 26 minute gap but like between the the guy being the the suspect being uh, spotted like observed and then and then all of a sudden 26 minutes later he's taking shots at former president trump so it's i mean it's right. tough you and know? It, it's a it's a failure and there's no way i can i can get around that um i'm just saying in, as, as a normal protocol that that counter sniper uh team that came out to advance it they looked at the motorcade route. They looked at the airport. They looked at this, the main site. They do a survey and they basically say, we're going to occupy high ground, but these are some other concerns we have. And every uh, person that's part of this advanced team, our job is to identify problems and then uh, solve those problems, right? So if you're the transportation agent and you see that, you know, this route has railroad tracks and that, you know, no matter how much we try to talk to the railroad, we might be stopped at a railroad crossing for 10 minutes. That's a, that's not good. Right. <laughs> so we're going to find an alternate route. Right. So, um, so I was a member of a counter surveillance team for, for a year where it was my job to be in plain clothes and to look for, um, it was shortly after the events of nine 11. And my job was to look for, um, places where an organized attack would stem from, right? So I went out and advanced that for a week and I conducted surveillance on locations. And I, um, on game day, I partnered up with a state or local person. We were in plain clothes. Nobody knew who we were. And, and our job was we were going to, if the bad guy was going to launch something, we had some ideas on where it was the most effective for them to launch that. So I can assure you that CS advanced team knew that that roof was a problem right now. There's a, there's a thousand ways to solve a problem in the secret service. So we can put five agents up on the roof. We can put, we can ask for police assistance and put, you know, five police officers on that roof. We can, um, we can ring the, the perimeter of the building with police officers. We can ring the building with agents, right? So, if you were asking me how me or the myriad of uh, my colleagues would have handled that is, yeah, that would have been seen to us as a concern. The site advance agent who was concerned for the rally site that was brought to his attention and um, his or her attention. And we operate off of what we call concentric rings of security, right? So you have that detail, that shift of five to seven to eight people. They are physically the closest to the protectee. That's the first concentric ring, right? And then you go out a little bit and then you have the site and the site is secured by police and the site is secured by agents. And then you go out a little further and you have that kind of that sec that third concentric ring. That's the magnetometers. That's the counter sniper teams. That's the counter surveillance teams. Um, there's a myriad of other tools we have out there that I won't get into. Um, those are all the people who you know, the theory is if the bad guy is going to try his attempt, his or her attempt, they don't get through the, that outer ring, right? But if they get through that outer ring, that second ring should solve the problem. And then lastly, you got those people closest to the president. And um, I think we'll all agree that their response was exactly how it's trained to be. And if I can take a second, um, as you Please. can imagine, from Saturday to, you know, we're taping this or recording this on what, Tuesday. Um, so four days or so have, have passed. The sheer amount of people who claim to be experts on social media um, who may have never conducted a productive advance in their life, but they have security after their name or they are a retired agent from some other agency. Um, so just like case in fact, I um, listened to a person opine the other day on uh, the Secret Service failed. Uh, they had President Trump uh, behind 
the, you know, vulnerable on that stage for a minute and 58 seconds. And if I could just, could I address that just for a second? The, the mic is yours. Go for okay. it. Yes. So this is the way I see it. And this is just one person's perspective, but I, I did it for 23 years. And um, I think the people on that stage, those agents um, performed admirably, right? So yes, we drop the ball, shots rang out, right? Um, we all are taught in the police academies, actions quicker than reaction, right? But those agents were on that stage. Our, our whole theory, if there's an attack, is called cover and evacuate. We want to make him as small as possible, him or her as small as possible. We want to use our bodies to cover him and shield him or her. And then when the time is right, sometimes that's immediately, sometimes it's not, we're going to evacuate to another place of safety. Generally, that means getting the heck out of there, right? Going, going, going to a ballistic uh, car and getting out there and going to a relocation um, site. So, in, in that incident, incident on Saturday, you know, what you see is that bunting, that's steel, right? That's um, steel that is very hard to penetrate. So the president was smart enough. He, he's been taught that he needs to make himself small and that he needs to get behind this steel. The agents got on top of him. So now if, if and of course, they're all wearing vests, but it's not going to really protect against a rifle round, but it's going to probably slow it down. But um, they have now protected him. I need to, as a detail leader, and I've been a detail leader hundreds of times, I need to do some real quick observations, right? How many times has, it been, has he been hit? Where is it coming from? But right now I'm behind steel and my counter sniper I know has responded. Um, I've got counter assault team, which we didn't talk about. Um, at the scene, my shift agents are all there. We are taught, the Secret Service agents are taught, always think diversion, right? Was that the first strike of a multiple strike attack, right? So you as a police officer, you know about cover and concealment and you know about moving from cover to cover. It's the same concept here, right? So I've got pretty good cover where I'm at on that stage. And real quickly, I need to make a, a set of decisions. How bad is he injured? Is he going to be able to walk? I want to talk to him if I'm able to talk to him. Is he making sense? Has it, you know, struck him somewhere that's impacted, you know, his ability to move, his ability to speak? Are there any other holes in him? Do we need to do emergency medicine right now? Um, but there's a whole lot of things. And I don't want to move until other resources are for our counter assault team. And those are the guys you see. Well, now I know as a detail leader, that if I do need to move him, I've got suppressive fire available to me to neutralize any other potential threats, right? Um, you also hear uh, radio traffic shooters down. So that's uh, more than likely coming from our counter sniper team telling us, okay, so at least that first initial threat is down, right? So that gives me some more, a little bit more confidence. Um, and then of course, you if you've got a willful protectee who says, you know, um, hey, I'm okay. I want to get my shoes. Um, you know, in hindsight, not under the spur of the moment, you would have just, you know, screw the shoes, right? Or, um, you know, ha have an agent pick up the shoes or whatever. But if the, t if the decision was made that we need to move our protectee from one position of safety to a better position of safety, we're going to screw the shoes, right? Forget the shoes. Um, but when we're recorded under stress, you know it, police officers and agents often do things that you say to yourself, looking back on it on video, you're like, why the heck did I do that? Right. So I, I was assigned as a um, detailed instructor to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Um, and we used to teach what we called stress inoculation drills. Right. So you want to put these trainees into very stressful situations so that when they're exposed to it in real life, it's, it's nothing but a thing, right? They're, they're able to, to know, right? Why do we pepper spray officers before we give them pepper spray? And, and a good agency will expose them to OC and then make them do something, fight their way out of something, handcuff somebody, move a, a hundred pound dummy, 
um, because it, it instills confidence that, you know what, if the bad guy does spray you or your partner accidentally sprays you, you are going to survive this. You can fight through it. You can make the arrest. You can do what you need to do. Right. So, um, yeah, uses of force are never pretty. And what we call an AOP, an attack on a protectee, is never pretty either. So um, I, I just kind of wanted to talk about that kind of little pet peeve. A lot of armchair quarterbacks saying, you know, that Secret Service failed by not moving him to that car faster. Oh, I I agree. I mean, we're, having worked in local law enforcement for a long time and people would chime in, well, local law enforcement should have done this, should have done that. And these are the people that would never sign up to be police. I, right. I can relate on that matter with you. Uh, but like I said, uh, this whole episode, I mean, it's just asking questions and we're offering, and I'm, I appreciate you offering information. And in my opinion, they're, Obviously, will be a huge debrief, one that we haven't seen in several years. I think the last assassination attempt was 43 years ago. Um, in in your opinion, well, let me ask you one question. Because sure. this has been said on the internet. Some have thought that the counter sniper was viewing that man with a rifle, or, you know, that saw he had a rifle and then waited for him to shoot before shooting back. Like, I cannot wrap that in my head to be truth at all. I, True. So I, I don't know what happened and, and all will be revealed as this thing gets um, investigated. But what I can say is a counter sniper is no different than a patrol officer on the street. We all have our use of force protocols, correct? So what I would say is, you know, was that vantage point that he had, was it enough to him to identify not only was it a person on the roof, but that they had a long gun. Um, so I, I wasn't in his shoes. I don't know what he could see or what he could not see in his scope or through the binoculars. But I would pose this question to you. So we we all we take our oath to protect our protectees um, sacred, right? I cannot foresee any circumstance where a secret service employee would hesitate to protect the life of the president when deadly force is authorized. Now, I can also uh, second guess and say, so what if he sees through his scope or through his binoculars, he sees a person on a roof? That's a problem. Hopefully there were entities going to it, counter sniper response teams or counter surveillance teams, local police, there should have been a lot of people going to that problem. But what if he took that shot based on 70% assurance that it was a bad guy and it ended up being a 14-year-old autistic kid climbing up on the roof to get a better vantage point, right? So you know the use of force law. I know the use of force law. What does it generally boil down to in a colonel? I need to, there's an immediate threat to my life or the threat of another human being's life. And then I'm authorized to use deadly force, right? We all get it. I've been put in use of force situations where I've had to make that mental leap that, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to have to make a decision here. Our counter sniper team, Secret Service counter sniper teams, I would put them against not anything against the military snipers. But our, our folks are very, very good at what they do. Um, but they also have to uh, comply with legal requirements. But I can assure you, um, you know, these things will shake out. But I cannot envision any circumstance where a Secret Service employee, knowing that our protectee is in mortal danger, would not use deadly force to stop that attack. I agree. I, I can't wrap my head around someone thinking that. I. Yeah, uh, obviously many details will be discovered. Uh, I mean, months, a year from now, uh, it's it's a lot is going to go into this. And, and, and if I could just say one thing, Scott is yeah, um, please. So I've had uh, visits of protectees, you know, minor and and large. So everything from, you know, the president of some small Caribbean island country who has zero threat footprint um, to coordinating visits for multiple heads of state and, and president and vice president, all that sort of stuff. The secret service does an after action 
you know, in the field office or on the details after every visit, right? We get together and we do a, uh, what do they call it? A cold wash, right? Um, what went right? What went wrong? What did we learn? What are we never going to do again, right? So we learned that um, from our mistakes with the Reagan attempt and we changed the way things are done. If you if you went to that Washington Hilton during the Reagan attempt and now you go now, you know, there's a garage um, that's built for a limousine that's in that Washington Hilton. I think the Secret Service even paid for it, right? Because the president goes to that Hilton so many times because of the ballroom. Um, so when we can, we're going to try to have a, a close, what we call a closed arrival, covered arrival, right? So um, the theory is you can't hit what you can't see. So if our president's behind, you know, enclosed in this garage, you don't know where he or she is at. Um, we learned that, you know, the doors to that armored limo needs to be open if the protectee is anywhere within that, because that's our, that, you know, that ballistic, you know, basically for lack of a better term, that's our ballistic shield. We want to try to get him, him or her into there as quickly as possible. You know, with of course with the Kennedy assassination, you know, you don't see us with convertibles anymore. You don't see us with, you know, a lot of those mistakes. So we're going to learn from, from this. Um, I'm not here to second guess, um, but I'm pretty sure when it all shakes out is we knew that roof, that building was going to be a problem and that for some reason something fell through the cracks. That's what we need to learn from. That's what we need to rectify going forward. Absolutely. And I, I just wanted to say that you had mentioned earlier how those close to those agents close to former President Trump uh, did what exactly what they were supposed to do by piling on to him for to provide cover for him. That that in in my opinion is very admirable in the sense that they they have no idea whether shots are going to come raining down on them or not. How does the Secret Service? It, hopefully, you can answer this. How does the Secret Service ensure or train people in a way to make it so that they don't think about it? They just do it out of instinct, which they should. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the four month school that I talked about at our training center, you know, it's everything from you know driving limos and what we call follow ups. Those those true armored vehicles that carry our agents behind um, firearms first, you know, a pretty advanced first aid, um, everything you could imagine. But one of the things that we do routinely, you know, we, we conduct advances for protectees at actual sites. So we go out into the public and, you know, we do an advance at the, the Washington Hilton ballroom with, you know, a, a president of the United States with, thousands of guests, right? And it's, um, if we're going to make mistakes, let's make mistakes in training, right? But one of the things that is sprinkled throughout that whole training program is what we call AOPs, um, attacks on our protectees or attacks on our principals. And you uh, work as shift agents and you may go through 10 sites where nothing bad happens. And then the 11th site, uh, somebody comes with a knife, a gun, a punch, uh, OC spray, whatever, you know, the, the attack could be. Um, and then you are trained and drilled on how to cover and evacuate. And different people are assigned as detail leaders and assigned as shift agents and, and you rotate through. But by the end of that four month period, um, it's instantaneous. And, you know, I just a little aside, I came from, I was a police officer for four years and I went through Secret Service school and one of the very first uh, attacks on principles was a bad guy coming down a hallway towards us, uh, shooting us with simunition. And what does a police officer do? You engage the bad guy, right? So my police training kicked in. So this is in training, you know, I'm still trying to learn our techniques and I see this threat coming towards me and I took out my handgun and I returned fire and, you know, neutralized him and then I got the reaming of my life, right? Um, our job is not to stand there as a detail agent and engage the problem. Uh, we have a phrase in the Secret Service, minimum to the problem, maximum to the protectee. And when you're a detail agent, um, there's other people that are gonna be responsible for neutralizing that attack. You need to take care of that protectee. So. You know, on my very first AOP, I, I failed miserably, right? And I was interesting. I, I heard I was told I was told to in front of everybody how I had failed miserably, um, <laughs> and I never made that mistake again. Well, I, I, I hope, I hope that answered I, I did. I did hear a 
former Secret Service agent who I listened to in particular, he mentioned that fact that that detail that covered former President Trump, he said, you notice they covered, they didn't have their weapons out. Their job is not to fight. That's what the two uniformed guys were with the long guns out, that they were the ones to engage any any potential additional threats right. that might have been out there. Uh, so that's that's interesting to hear you say the same exact thing. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak about all this. And going forward, look, uh, hum, uh, Secret Service agents are human, obviously. They're going to have the emotions. They're going to go through a lot of things because of what happened this past Saturday. They're, they're still going to have to wake up and be Secret Service agents. I don't want them to beat themselves up. They got to be focused on how can we prevent this again? Because yeah, it, somewhere along the lines, it, like you said, someone got in the cracks and, or, and, it, and it fell through communication. We, we don't know all the details, right? but what encouragement do you give the agents right now who were particularly there or other agents who are rattled by all this? And I don't want them to cave to pressure. I, I want them to build themselves up so that they're not fumbling with their sidearm, you know, that, like they're ready to go. Right. Uh, what, what advice would you give? Yeah, no, I would just, um, you know, our, the motto of the Secret Service is worthy of trust and confidence. And, and I know the people that staff this agency, our uniformed division officers and our, our agents, um, they are some of America's best. Um, we were very fortunate that our mistake on Saturday didn't end the way other people um, wanted it to end. But we will learn from this. And, and to the critics, what I would say is, uh, it's a great agency. If you want to improve it, go get an application, right? Um, you will do things and see things. I have been to places that you only read about in books. I have met people that, uh, you know, near mere mortals never really get to meet. I've, I've been in situations that uh, when I was uh, polygraphing our applicants, I used to say it's a front seat to watch history unfold front row seat to watch history unfold. You will, you know, if you think about it, everywhere our protectees go, Secret Service has got to go with them. And our protectees go to some amazing places and have some amazing experiences. A lot is demanded of you. Um, a lot will be expected of you. Um, you have, you know, some very high um, responsibilities, but man, it is a great ride. And if if you are current military, former military, um, I would just, it is a great ride. I, I couldn't um, talk highly enough about it. Um, we will we will solve these problems, um, but we need America's support. We need our law enforcement officers' support. The, the amount of, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with constructive criticism, but the amount of opining by so-called experts, you know, the piling on, it's just, and if I could just say one last thing, Scott, the, you know, I go on social media and I see Americans talking about how they wished he had been a better shot um, and how, you know, it's too bad that he missed and we need some better firearms training. I, I fear for my country if we have a portion of the population that no matter who the candidate is, whether you agree with them or not, no matter who the president or vice president, whether you agree with them or not, um, this is not how we do things here and to celebrate or to wish that the results had been different. It's, I don't even have words. I, I don't even understand this population that sees that as a, as a, uh, you know, near success as opposed to a, you know, um, just a horrific day for the country. So. Glad you said that. And I echo your sentiments. It's uh I can't wrap my head around it. Yes. And unfortunately there were innocent victims, right. Who yeah. were, were there to, I mean, what, there's nothing more American, right. Than I'm going to go to small town America, you know, middle America. I'm going to go see this person who's, whether you're going to vote for him or not, just to, to hear him speak, to be part of the environment um, and to lose your life that way. It's just, um, and to have people, cheer that on. It's just, I, I don't, I don't even have words no, just to describe it. But just as you said, the people that are 
still showing up to be of service. Uh, we'll look back and we'll learn from it. And fortunately, uh, there, fortunately, former President Trump survived. Uh, and I just say that as someone who just sees him as a person. And it, you just hate to see someone uh, get killed. But unfortunately, yeah, the retired fire chief. But I admire the heck out of that man. I, di I didn't know, I didn't know anything about him, but he he died protecting his family, he was shielding a hero. his family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he cover so, and evacuated is what he did. Exactly. And, uh, no, no greater love. And uh, Kevin, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. My pleasure. To, and Scott, thank uh, you for your service, not only in the military, but in the police uh, world. And then what you're doing outside is um, trying to make the law enforcement community a better community. So I thank you for all that. I appreciate it.